Richard Moore, you are enormously welcome in the studio. Thank you. Good to be here, Ron. Uh, just as I was enormously welcomed back in 1970 at Operation Motorman in Derry, right. when I was there covering it for the Independent all yeah. those years ago. God, you, were I, much, you were a young fellow then. I was only a youngster, and uh, certainly different times now, isn't it? Different times indeed. Uh, One senses in some kind of way, and I know it's a, a moral dilemma, that the rough times had to happen to allow the good times to come. I don't know where the truth lies in that statement, but it's, it's a perplexing thing. We came through awfulness and now we have arrived at a form of passivity. Uh, I think you're right. Well, I mean, it's sad that the times had to happen and when you think of the suffering that some individuals had to cope with and still are dealing with in their lives, you know, it could have been a, a period that maybe on reflection we could have avoided. Um, mm. But nevertheless, we are where we are and it's important that we embrace what we have now and, and try to mm. move forward, you know. I remember the dairy of those days when on Sundays before lunchtime, there yeah. was a customary riot where the, the rubber bullets and the CS gas That's were right. everywhere uh, and the youngsters were out taking on the army and come lunchtime it all went quiet and maybe then in the afternoon there was a bit more of it. Those were, those were days that touched us all really. That's right, well recreational riding I suppose you might call it, and, uh, but you had to stop for your Sunday dinner. Yeah, you had at all times, at all times. Uh, and the other thing, if you didn't arrive home for your Sunday dinner, you see your mother knew where you we were. They give so. you worse than the soldiers would have given you too. That's right. <laughs> but I mean, there was lads there, I remember it, and, and unfortunately it didn't happen to you. There were lads there who would make a fellas of hurling prowess. Yes. They could jump and catch the rubber bullet it would come. And you could buy rubber bullets in the city of Derry in those days, we captured rubber bullets, so to speak. Well that's right, they were collector's items in a sense and there, there probably at one time there wasn't a house in the city that didn't have a rubber bullet in their possession where you know, I mean in one night for example you would have got maybe 500 rubber bullets fired in some yeah. situations so people collected them and kept them in the house and even put yeah. them in these nice wee stands that were built for them and stuff well, so they he almost held a position of pride sometimes. Well the stand that was held for them when your person was the awfulness of it hitting your face and uh. hitting your eye. Do you remember the day? I remember it very well. I probably remember it very well for two reasons. One is obviously it was the most significant thing to happen to me in my life. You know, the fact that I was shot and blinded by a rubber bullet at 10 years of age and, you know, everything I've done since then, the journey I've been on, uh, on throughout my life until now, uh, was, as many ways, has been dictated by that incident. And, and not in a negative way, in a positive way. You know, so for that reason, and as well as that, you know, I get the opportunity to talk about it quite a bit, so it's yeah. kept the memory alive in many ways. And in many ways, talking about it, especially to younger people, it's uh, offering them the wisdom of the, the science of forgiveness. That's true. And, I mean, it, it, I suppose it highlights the futility of violence and the fact that there's nothing to be gained by the blinding of me, for example but also equally the amazing humanity that came about as a result of my blindness, like my parents, my family, my community, that rallied behind me and the teachers and schools. And I think back on the efforts that so many people made in my life to make me the person I am. And mm. even the fact that I'm sitting here in Uri today, mm. where people are, you know, uh, like Jack and Gemma and Deborah and Joanne, where they're all willing to help children across fire and help me yeah. achieve what I'm trying to achieve, you know, mm. And the very existence of the organisation Children in Crossfire, which I started in '96, is, is, is because I'm only giving back a fraction of what I've received. Mm. At what point, Richard, did you feel the imperative to create Children in Crossfire? What was the genesis of it? Uh, well, I think um, when I I was a, I was self-employed after I came out of university. I was what was your degree? Uh, social administration. I thought mm. I wanted to be a social worker. Yeah, and a good uh, one you would have been, because <laughs> to be well. a good social worker takes guts and uh, bottle. I dare say you have that in abundance. Well, you know, uh, and I think in many ways we're all social workers in different ways, and you know, and how we relate to people and all of that. And I sort of that was a career I was plotting out for myself, but I was compensated by the British government for being shot, and with some of the money I bought a pub, and then I had a second pub, and by the time I came into university, I had my own business. Mm -hmm. And during my self-employed life. I become very aware of, you know, what, how, how lucky I was, how blessed I was, the, you know, the, the, of the good things in my life. And mm -hmm. I also become very aware of children in other parts of the world who maybe had their eyesight, but didn't have anything that I had, didn't have the opportunities, didn't have, in many cases, a family network. 
and didn't have basic things like education, food in her stomach, access to medicine, uh, you know, and so many things. And uh, I, I suppose in my early 20s, I began to feel that I would like to dedicate my time uh, to to working and helping children in other parts of the world who weren't as lucky as me. Where did the awareness come from, first of all, and secondly, yeah. the response to the awareness? Well, I think I became, you know, I suppose how far back do you go? I can remember in school when the, 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 the priests used to come around uh, from the missions talking about the work that they did. And then, I don't know if you remember the old uh, uh, the Far East magazine. Oh, I do, of course. I always remember yeah. flicking through that yep. and looking at the pictures. Mm. I also think that there was an organisation that's based in Dublin called AFRI. Mm. Um, and um, I used to organise itineraries for these uh, the development workers coming to Ireland mm -hmm. uh, that wanted to come to Northern Ireland to you know meet politicians and meet victims of the troubles and I used to or at their mm -hmm. request organize the dairy side of it but while they were listening to the stories in Northern Ireland I was listening to their stories mm -hmm. and I was totally enthralled by you know hearing about the children in different parts of the world and the conditions that people were facing there and always felt you know in many ways, the problems that we have in Northern Ireland are, are, were within our own hands. You know, they were solvable and very solvable by us. But the children in Africa and the countries where children are crossfire operate in other countries like Tanzania, Ethiopia and Gambia, in many ways the problems that they're facing are not in their hands. And they're caught in the crossfire of global decisions, of economic circumstances that mm. they can do nothing about. And I just felt that I would like to, I would like to do something and use my experience as a child and use my voice as a way in which I can help them. And in a strange way, you, you were empowered because uh, you, you, you had the businesses. Mm -hmm. It wasn't enough for you. You didn't want that, really. You Absolutely were driven to right. something else. I, I always remember going to, you know, I had a self-employed business and you know, I didn't really get any job satisfaction from it. I genuinely didn't. And I played in bands, I had a recording studio, all those things. And I enjoyed them all as, you know, to a certain degree. But nothing, absolutely nothing, gives me the satisfaction that I get in, in doing the work that I'm doing. You know, somebody said, you know, um, you know, in every act of generosity, there's an element of selfishness. And I, I can consist with that totally because oh, yeah. the selfish thing for me is I get so much pleasure out of it personally. But the Dalai Lama says selfishness is okay as long as it's good selfishness. Oh, so yeah. Uh, yeah. in that sense, I, I'm, I'm happy with that. Yeah, but I mean, in taking on the work and in accepting the feel-good factor, mm. you're also accepting the potential for heartbreak if it doesn't go well, if the children you help today are mm. gathered and imprisoned by Boko Haram or somebody else and taken off, that's going to hurt you as much as, it, as, as if it were one of your own biological children. It does. Well, uh, although what I, you're right, and I remember one time we used to support a project in Sierra Leone was a rehabilitation of child soldiers. And there was a pretty big project, I think it was somewhere in the region of 400 child soldiers being rehabilitated at the time. And then a rocket landed in a village or something and all the children scattered in a project just literally ended overnight. Uh, so a lot of the work that was done was lost. But, you know, what it does with me is, and, and I get asked this question quite often, Rowan, uh, you know, in terms of, does it not break your heart when you go to Africa? Of course it breaks your heart, mm -hmm. but it redoubles your efforts. Yeah. You come away with a fire in your belly like nothing normal, and mm -hmm. you think, well, you know, and, and what I've learned to do is focus on what's been achieved, focus on what I can do, not what I can't do, and that's in relation to my disability, mm -hmm. that's in relation to the work that we do. I try to focus on the positive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes you feel like you're scratching a mountain with a toothpick. Other times you think, well, what's important is the people that you actually do reach. Mm -hmm. That's the, the notion of uh, it mattering to one or two people, and those one or two will go on to help somebody else. And that's there, right. There is a, there's a, a development project there, a personal development project for people who reach out to others and it grows and grows and grows. That's right. And, you know, why am I doing what I do? It's because of the example I got in life. Hopefully the children that we work with will look back on what they've experienced, and not with me personally, but with the work 
of local organisations with their parents, whatever, and they can use that to transform the lives of other people too. And I mean, it just, if, if anything, my blindness and my story is a loving example of how you can use what's happened to you in a positive way. How you can, you know, despite your own difficulties, no matter how difficult life is for you, that you can use what you have to help others. And that's all I ever wanted to do. Uh, and like, you know, if, you know, my blindness means that I help one child in Africa. It's worth the blindness. Then it's worth it. Aye. And to be honest, if I had to give up all of that tomorrow and erase it from my mind just to have my eyesight back, you wouldn't then I'd want my eyesight back. No, you don't. Of course you don't. No, there's a lad, there's a lad I'm aware of in India. He's mm. no longer in India. Yeah. But he was savagely challenged physically, but highly intelligent. And he used to say, I can do anything. It just takes me a wee bit longer. Yeah. And the same applies, you know, you can work with the blindness. Is it total blindness? Total blindness. Aye. Total blindness. Aye, totally blind. Yeah. Was there a, a millisecond at any stage of anger as a consequence of it? I never had a moment's anger really? about blindness or being shot or anything. Thank God I didn't. And, you know, I wonder why I often, I mean, I'm asked a question, you know, when I go to schools, like, or when I go anywhere, that, and I, I find myself thinking about it. And I think it came from my parents, Rowan. Mm -hmm. I mean, my mother, I never, I never heard my mother or my father speak an angry word. Mm. And in fact, they said the opposite. And, you know, I, I often recount the story about one of my brothers. See, I had an uncle shot dead on Bloody Sunday. My mammy's brother, Jared McKinney. Uh, was shot dead name, on yep. and then I was blinded four months later mm. and I remember one of my brothers in a very angry fashion a very colourful language mm. saying to my mother in our kitchen one day you know about you know the only way is to get your own back mm. more or less and I remember my mommy saying to him if you want to help Richard you go in there and help Richard but you're not helping Richard be hurting somebody else Indeed you're not I, and, you know, people always say to me that they're amazed at my forgiveness and all that. And they do. And I understand the words and I understand what they're saying. But I never felt that I was doing anything amazing. You have this ble it's, it's a blessed thing. It's the, you're the exemplification of that section of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And you, it comes to uh, you with relative ease and with a naturalism. It does. And it, I'm very lucky because I've seen a lot of angry people. I've seen the results of anger, you know, when you look at the consequence of what anger does, you know, and uh, I just think that if we're to have true peace in our lives, whether it be an ordinary conflict, whether it be an argument with a loved one, whether it be a family fallout, whatever it is, until you reconcile it in your own heart, in your own head, then there's, you know, there's not going to be true peace. And you've got the, I think, do it for your own personal happiness. Mm -hmm. Forget about the other person. Forgiveness is not about the other person. It's about you and about mm -hmm. your happiness, about your peace of mind, about your ability to move on. And the thing is, once you reach it, it's amazing. And like, that's, you know, when I, as I say, I never understood the emotion of forgiveness until I brought Charles the soldier that blinded me up to meet my mommy. Voice is there. And I saw this wee 88 year old woman who was basically four foot nothing standing with this six and a half foot retired army major who blinded her son and hurt her so much. And she was so kind, she was so gentle, she sat him down, she showed him all the family photographs and he said to her something about, look, I really regret what happened that day. And she says, listen, it's all over now. It's all over now. And yeah. he, she was so kind with him. And it was then that I literally felt the power, the real power mm. of forgiveness. You see, you haven't needed eyes to do the things you've done in Children and Crossfire. And that has been your raison d'etre, the great cause of your life. That's right. And I mean, I think when I look back at blindness, Rowan, and look back at the journey so far, I mean, it's about accepting what you have. I mean, I can understand a sighted person looking at me and thinking, how can he cope with being blind? God, if I was blind, I couldn't cope. And I think if I had my eyesight looking at a blind person, I would say the exact same thing. But when, um, 
you know, when you learn to work within the limitations that whatever mm. it is that you face, um, and just learn to navigate around it, mm. then you become very content. Mm. I mean, if I wanted to drive a car, for example, then I'm going to spend every day of my life being frustrated. Of course you are. But mm. I don't need to drive a car. Mm. I have enough people to drive cars around me. Mm. And, you know, you just learn to put the mechanisms in place, to put the, the, the tools in place to allow you to do what you want to do. And, you know, I think sometimes our perception of disability, it's almost like we, it's a self-fulfilled prophecy in a sense. You know, you're disabled, so it's terrible. And then you begin to believe that it's terrible. And I mean, I know it's easy for me to say, and I realise somebody watching this programme may be having difficulty dealing with their own disability or their own issue in their life, and I understand that. But all that I can do is share honestly what I believe. And, you know, as Sean Vanier said once, if you looked at a, f a field full of daffodils and there was one tulip, you wouldn't say that flower was disabled. You would say that it's different. Different, people and, different ones. And certainly I am different. Yeah. because I've lost my eyesight. But you know what? What blindness has brought me in life, I can't separate the good things in my life from blindness itself. Yeah. No, blindness has brought me a lot of good things. Yeah. But there's been challenges. But the challenges are as big or as small as you make them, yeah. depending on your own attitude. Children you know? in Crossfire, what's your greatest project at the moment? Well, I mean, uh, we have a variety of projects. I mean, um, you know, in the last couple of years, we've been working with a children's cancer unit in Dar es Salaam. There's an amazing woman called Dr. Trish Scanlon. She's a Dublin doctor who we've been, you know, basically supporting her to achieve what she wants to achieve out there. Where basically, when we got involved, uh, Dr. Trish was there. She was fighting to work 24 hours a day. She was the only pediatric oncologist in the country mm. in a ward where there was 60 children with cancer. 17 beds and their parents and their guardians because as you know if out there they have no money no resources mm -hmm. when it, so when a mother brings a child to a hospital she has the only thing she has is the clothes on her back it's true. so they end up staying in the ward so at one case there was something like 120 people in this small room with 17 beds in it and only roughly you know 10 to 12 percent of the children were surviving so almost 90 percent of the children that came there died uh, from cancer. And, you know, today, the survival rate is 65%. Mm. And that's because of proper medicine, proper medical support, mm. proper diagnosis, better conditions. And that's something that Children in Crossfire supported Dr. Trish in trying to achieve. And, you know, with, with her effort and our support, she w we were able to change the, you know, the thing around. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, our big focus at the moment is early childhood education mm. because a lot of children in the developing world don't get access to education. And, you know, the, the impact that that has in that country going forward in the future is enormous. Mm. And then you look at the reasons behind that. They're malnourished, there are no schools, there are no trained teachers, or they have to stay in the, the small farm allotments to help their parents or whatever. So it's trying to influence all those situations mm. so that children can be given the same opportunities that you and I have enjoyed in our lives. What drives you? Your mother, your mother put goodness into you, put the ability to forgive in you. Did she also build into you a, a faith in a God? Absolutely. My, my, my parents were two very devout Catholics. And, uh, you know, I think it, it would be a mistake of me not to acknowledge the, that's influence in my life and I think religion at various times like every other person you tap into it when you think you need it most and then you sort of forget about it for a wee while but it's always there it's always that that basis is there and I suppose what my mother gave me was a core compassion and I, I witnessed it in her and my daddy and I witnessed it in the people that give, give so much to me in their lives I mean I became a project for a lot of people in terms of their sense of commitment to me and support for me. And I only have to look around me everywhere I go, as I say down here today, of the amount of support, goodwill, and genuine uh, concern for me that I get through, throughout my life. And that's the driving factor for me. Richard Moore, children in Crossfire, go well and keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, Ron. Thank you God very much. You. Thank, Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.